it is clearly a very powerful tool tool being used by the global cabal to manipulate and propagandize the population unequivocally, no doubt about it. But with respect to the differences between the two scenarios, uh, they never quarantined healthy people before. Right. There was this whole concept of asymptomatic spreaders. And for the most part, it's a false, fraudulent concept. It's, it's not accurate. People without symptoms rarely, if ever, spread the disease. You have to be, you have to have symptoms. So it makes no sense to put this massive lockdown on the premise that some asymptomatic person is going to be spreading the disease. So there they have no science, no studies support that. None, zero, nada. So they didn't do that as far as as far as I'm aware in the Spanish flu. Hi, welcome to the Wigan Sessions. I'm Addison Wigan. I have with me today Dr. Joseph Mercola. Uh, he's a board certified physician and uh, the steward of one of the largest um, websites for nutritional um, supplements and medicine uh, in the world. Uh, he's also well known for having um, uh, we'll get into this later, but the New York Times called you, uh, Dr. Mercola, <laughs> the largest spreader of misinformation about COVID. I want to ask you about that, but uh, before we get into it, I'd like to welcome you to the Wigan Sessions, and thank you for joining me. And I'd like to uh, have you just kind of introduce yourself because this is the first time we met, and, uh, and <clears throat> I'd like to do it properly. So welcome, and thank you for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. So uh, I'm a <clears throat> board certified family physician and I've treated tens of thousands of patients uh, and was brainwashed by the medical system to prescribe medications. It took me about six, seven years to get out of that. And then as I acquired knowledge and information, um, I integrated one of my other passions, which was technology, because I... Um, <clears throat> Took my first programming class in 1968, which was when the internet was developed, uh, was Fortran and COBOL I studied. And uh, I've been passionate about technology ever since. And so in the mid 90s, or late 90s, actually, I started my website, Mercola.com, which has been the most visited, which is the most objective barometer of a uh, natural health site in the world for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, I was a, been a rebel because I rejected conventional medical approaches. And uh, even early on when I first started <laughs> having my site, which was not designed to sell products, but eventually <laughs> after five years, we had to have some source of revenue because my medical practice wouldn't support me that that habit because it was just costing too much. It was getting into you know well over a million dollars a year to run the site with no revenue coming in other than my medical practice. So we we do sell supplements to support our free newsletter. Um, but the um, been a rebel. So as a result of that, I'm used to the discrediting that the conventional medical model throws at us, and um, and you're. A, comment that I was the recognized by not only the New York Times, but also CNN as the uh, super spreader of misinformation. Uh, there, there was a, um, a front group called the, um, what's this front group called? I forgot the name of it, but it was spun up in the U UK uh, and funded by the global cabal to discredit anyone who was opposing their narrative. And I, there would, they compiled a, a list of 12 individuals that they call them the misinformation dozen. And I was the leader of the group, Bobby Kennedy was number two. So they had a nice big front page article on the New York Times actually uh, it was in July of last year where I was the number one news story in the world because, they, because of this, which is interesting. And then CNN, not to be outdone, decided to do uh, stalk me at my 
try to find me at my office, but I don't work at the office. I work in my home, which is about 300 miles away. So they stalked me in my office and followed me to the beach where I take my daily walk and tried to interview me. It was and that 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 way video went viral. So and then this just this year, the New York Times did an hour documentary on me to try to discredit me again. Um, they, that was only the second one that they've done this year. The first one was on Elon Musk. So I feel like I'm good company and the vilification discrediting they hurled at me is probably one of the biggest badges of honors I've ever gotten to be recognized as literally and or willing doublespeak, the, the most significant person telling the truth about COVID-19. Or the, the reality is the most significant voice that was a threat to their narrative. Yeah, so can you kind of take me behind the scenes then? Uh, just how, um, like, what was it that that piqued their interest so much in what you were saying? You were you were talking about the science behind the vaccines and mm -hmm. the way that the narrative was being spun up in the media, uh, mostly. But what was your experience while while that was happening? Like, what what, what was the counter narrative? Might be a, a good way to get into that. Well, I suspect that they focused on me because I had developed a credibility over the last 25 years of, of having a, a local a, a, a significant following uh, before we, we were banned by Google in 2008, 2018, they took us off the search engines. And uh, so that really had an impact on our, on our uh, views, but we were getting 30 million views a month, unique visitors, not just hits. But unique visitors, so that we, you know, we basically were being followed by people all over the world and every continent, and uh, who who were just not visitors, but they were followers. So they would listen to what we say and implement, and you know, the trust and credibility had built up over two decades. So I, I basically exposed this with facts, information. I wasn't the only one out there, but because I was probably the one that's been out there the longest doing this. Um, I was perceived as the biggest threat. Um, so, yeah, I still want to get a little bit behind the scenes. Like, what were you exposed to? Like, what, what about the science? Like, we can get, kind of get into um, what your your analysis was and what what you were telling. Well, that it was essentially telling followers. Yeah, yeah, it was just a hoax. I mean, our initial process was that we said very early on, February of two thousand twenty that uh, we had Francis Boyle, who is a mayor, no, not a mayor, a professor of law at the University of Illinois, and the, pers the person who actually drafted the bioweapon treaty in the 1980s, um, that this was a bioweapon. This came from, a, this virus was not, leaked, it is not transmitted by, by animals and it was not the source or the origin of the virus. It was engineered as a bioweapon in a lab funded by the United States. So that information, if you said it, got you deplatformed immediately even though we had all the facts for it and right. And as today, there's, there's uncontroversial evidence that should shows that's the case. So uh, that was one. Then uh, more importantly, I think, to warn people that <clears throat> this, there was a narrative going on and telling them the details behind what was the, the lies and the propaganda that were being spread. And uh, specifically about the fact that there were ways to treat this, that you did not have to that you could improve your immune system, something as simple as vitamin D, which I had an article published in Nutrients in October of 2020. 2020. So just saying that being in the sun will improve your vitamin D and radically improve your ability to fight these upper respiratory infections, including COVID. And that would be a basis for getting discredited and deplatformed. So simple things, basics, and, the, and warning them about the dangers of the jab. I don't call it a vaccine because it isn't. They actually had to change the definition of vaccine to include that in it. This is not a traditional vaccine. It's a, it's a bioweapon. It's a bioweapon engineered in a lab. It's very dangerous. It causes your body to make this protein, the spike protein specifically, that damages your body in profound ways. And it does absolutely nothing to reduce your risk of getting sick. In fact, it actually has negative effects. So it, it, it actually makes you more likely and more susceptible to get sick from the very illness it's, it's allegedly designed to protect you against.
how, how how does that science work? You were saying it manufactures a protein in your well, body. Well, you know, I, I didn't really want to get into to discuss this. I'm happy to address that, but I mean, I literally could talk for hours on this, and there's a lot of <laughs> important things to do. But uh, it, you know, I wrote a whole book on this, The Truth About COVID-19, which was one of the best books of on COVID in last year. Bobby, it was second only to Bobby Kennedy's book. My book, when it was out, was the number one book sold in the U.S. of any book. Uh, for a week or two, so it was very popular, and it goes. I go into all the details of the book. The book, the book is called "The Truth About COVID-19," but I, I go into all these details on my site. So I mean, I just, I, I can't. It's hard to summarize this whole thing in a few minutes. So I think there, we've got other things that. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. Well, what did you make when the CDC recently admitted? I think it was a couple of weeks ago that the, um, that the vaccines they finally came out and said the vaccines didn't. Um, prevent transmission and they were only no, that was that wasn't the cdc that was a member of pfizer's board i believe well that, i think that, pfizer did that. the same they they both came out uh it was pfizer first and then the cdc came out and said it as well yeah so the truth is coming out and we were saying these things for the last two years that it yeah. doesn't work that it had a very low infectivity rate uh and in fact the numbers are showing is even lower than we were initially projecting and the people and the fraud that was involved in <clears throat> the testing process and identifying people who were affected with the disease and the just shocking change, changing, just redefining basic words and definitions. Like a COVID death was anyone that died, anyone that died that had a positive test, a PCR test, which was totally manipulated to essentially make almost everyone positive. They're supposed to, it's a cycle threshold, it's called a CT, and it's supposed to amplify it about 25 times, and they were running it 40 times, which just makes almost every, the false positive rate was through the roof. So they would have someone dying in a car accident or a motorcycle accident and happen to have one of these false positive tests, and it was a COVID death. So all these numbers were inflated, and then the converse is that when someone died, authentically died, absolutely unequivocally died as a result of getting this COVID jab, the, the numbers were manipulated and reversed and they, and they didn't count any of those deaths. And even in the trials, when they were getting to, that they used to manipulate this, this to get the, the EUA, the emergency use authorization granted, they miscategorized any side effects from the vaccine. So essentially there was almost no side effects. And then, and then they, they, they manipulated the statistics to look like you're gonna get, an, if you take this jab, you're gonna get a 95% likelihood you're not gonna get the disease. And they, they, they manipulated that to show that was a relative risk, not an absolute risk. So the actual absolute risk was less than 1%, less than 1%. But people, you know, people don't understand statistics, and they and they do this. They did this. They actually did this and continue to do this with statin drugs, with the same same result, conflating absolute and relative risk. So it, it's just one of the greatest. It is probably the greatest crime in humanity in the history of humanity. What they've gotten away with, it, it is absolutely shocking. It's a dystopian reality that we're living in. Yeah. What do you attribute their motives to? Well, I. You know, not speculate, but it is very clear they have an agenda that could be ascribed to depopulation versus just increasing their power and control of the world. I mean, if you look at Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, they're looking at uh, essentially turning the whole world into their slaves. And so you're going to own nothing and you're going to have to rent from the people who do own it, which is going to be this global cabal of uh, a relatively few number of people. Um, they really want to eliminate all personal freedom and liberty, essentially global author authoritarian totalitarian state. Um, but last week we were talking, I was talking to James uh, Howard Kunstler and mm -hmm. we were talking about mass psychosis formation, um, which is- It's actually uh, a mass, form it's mass formation psychosis. Oh, sorry. A term. <laughs> A term originated by Matthias uh, Desmond, yes, who I yes. actually interviewed in the past, yeah. uh, and then popularized by Robert Malone on his 
Chris New Year's Eve podcast with Joe Rogan, which still to this day holds <clears throat> the most views of any recorded podcast, which is 50 million. Just, just marginally exceeding the interview he did with Peter McCullough two weeks earlier, which had 40 million. So he got, he, he's backed, Joe has backed off considerably since he got so much flack for that. And then the yeah. cyber issues. Well, they were, um, weren't they trying to also cancel him? <laughs> I think yeah, was, because he went out with the ivermectin. Yeah, they tried, they tried, they definitely attempted to discredit him big time. Yeah. So he dialed it back a bit. Um, but so let's just talk about mass formation psychosis a little bit, just because I'm interested in, in the topic. And then I also have a follow up question, which I'd like to, you to also address, which is um, when the when the pandemic came out and they started shutting down restaurants and that kind of thing. I was interested in what happened in previous pandemics, and I, obviously the Spanish flu would be a, a good one to start. What, um, if you were studying that, what what was different back then? Uh, obviously, people died, and they they counted, um, you know, the deaths, and then they could, like in this pandemic they compared the two. But what was different back then? I, I I read a lot of like news reports that they there were mass spreader events and there were um, you know they shut down restaurants and they and it disrupted the economy in a similar <laughs> way but not to the degree and I, I want to blame it on uh, <laughs> social media but I don't, I don't know if that's true no, social yeah, media is, is, is clearly a very powerful tool tool being used by the global cabal to manipulate and propagandize the population unequivocally, no doubt about it. But with respect to the differences between the two scenarios, uh, they never quarantined healthy people before. Right. There was this whole concept of asymptomatic spreaders. And for the most part, it's a false, fraudulent concept. It's, it's not accurate. People without symptoms rarely, if ever, spread the disease. You have to be, you have to have symptoms. So it makes no sense to have this massive lockdown on the premise that some asymptomatic person is going to be spreading the disease. So there were, they have no science, no studies support that. None, zero, nada. So they didn't do that as far as as far as I'm aware in the Spanish flu. Well, that's why I think it, it plays into the um, uh, mass formation psychosis because people went along with it in like well I mean the entire mass- world did <laughs> what now or how do you oh, during it? like when people retreated to their homes and they they self yeah, yeah absolutely there was a this was very clever this is not this was not done by accident this was clearly designed I mean I'm sure you're familiar with event 201 which preceded that was in October mid October of 2019 do you have you heard of that yes yeah, yeah. So that was that's strong evidence that supports that this was a planned event. There's no question about it. And they, I mean, during that event, eight weeks before in October of 2019, they had meetings with the you know Johns Hopkins and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and uh, the CIA was there. How and they were discussed all the major news agencies. They were discussing how they're going to address disinformation, misinformation. How they're going to deplatform people. Yeah. They had all the plans out there, and, and the, it was a simulated event tabletop event and they they of course the virus they used was a coronavirus how interesting so um so they planned this all and and they have become very effective it was it was well done it was a very obviously you just look at the results what they were able to get away with and still get away with it to this day that this has been an enormously effective strategy and i think largely related to the advent of technology what they didn't have i mean Hitler tried to do a similar thing in World War II, and he, he, basically the only technology he had was the radio, and he was fairly effective. But now you've got no, the radio is nothing compared to what they have now with social media, which is probably orders of magnitude more effective. And <clears throat> and one of the most powerful things they do is they, they control the search engine. Google is 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 really at the core of this global cabal, and they're one of the most powerful players. And most people don't have any idea that Google as a search engine itself, see the, the internet is probably one of the greatest innovations in the history of human humanity. No question. It's a treasure trove of information. You can essentially find anything you want until recently when Google started censoring and banning many sites. And, and so 
we don't have a free internet anymore. It's, it's you cannot find materials, even so. You know, certainly on political issues, but on many many things. And then you know, you would think, well, first of all, to get you to Google, Google has most people are unaware that ninety three percent of the searches done in the entire world are done in Google servers. Ninety three percent, and it's probably closer to ninety seven or ninety eight percent because all the other search engines. They most of them use Google's results and manipulate it in some way with and modify it uh, to, to, to their own needs, but essentially maintain the same uh, banning uh, and uh, censoring of information on sites. So the site still exists, like my site would be an example. We still exist, but we're not in their search engines. So unless you know the URL, the name of the site, there's no way you're going to find it. You just will not find it. So, so what, why is that important? Because you people can't search became, really. be, be, right. People became used to find using the internet as, as a way that they can research the truth, and they don't understand that it's virtually impossible to use a search engine nowadays to research the truth because you're only finding. A very small person, well, maybe it's small, I don't know the specific percent, but uh, you're not getting the entire picture. You are not. It's, so, and we can see this with the COVID 19 propaganda. You see, anything that's against the narrative will not be found in the search engine. It just will not. You have to get it on alternative media. Uh, so, you've got to go to the sites directly, or you have to have news feeds that, that access those sites because it's not going to show up in your search engine at all. It just will not. So, there you, that's one of the tools they use, and along with social media. You know, controlling Twitter and Facebook, Facebook primarily too. Facebook and Google and Twitter are the three big tools they're using to literally create the narrative and contribute to the mass formation psychosis you're referring to. That is what did it. Be and, and then in conjunction with the government essentially have been being having been captured by almost all the major industries and, and the regulatory interest industries that were supposed to monitor or the federal regulatory agencies that were used to monitor these industries have been captured by these industries. You know, the, the drug companies are a classic example, but it's also uh, in, in industry capturing the EPA and uh, agriculture capturing the USDA. So they manipulate and they, they change the rules and they control the narrative and, they, and they, they have the government agencies like the public health authorities, like the CDC, essentially are controlled by the drug companies. Or the industries they're supposed to to regulate, and they're they're not regulated. It's just completely perverse and and and, and reverse as uh, to the original design. So the, all those confluence of of uh, factors are set to, to essentially set up the almost ideal brainwashing machine, because you're what you know and believe to be authoritative, honest, factual. Truth tellers are not. It got twisted and they changed the whole thing. And then, so they're able to use that to convince people. And then you get enough people. And the social isolation is one of the things that contributes to misinformation psychosis. And that's what they did. They had lockdowns. They, they, people couldn't connect with each other. There were people, how many people died alone, which is one of the big sad tragedies of this whole process. And, you know, and, and, and all the damage that was done to the people in isolation to increase in mental disorders and depression and suicides, drug use, alcohol use, it all got catalyzed and act and increased because of the social isolation. And, but when you're isolated, you're far more susceptible to this brainwashing. So there was a wide variety of factors that led to the successful implementation of this mass formation. Demet, Desmet doesn't like to use the term psychosis because that is a, that's a, meets a very specific criteria in the, in the DSM four oh, okay. book. So he just likes to refer to it as mass formation. So it's like I mean, I, Malone. I mean, it's, it's, it's just another word for brainwashing at that point, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, you're absolutely correct. And in, in, in my interview, he said that many times. There, there, the uh, mass formation and brainwashing are the, are essentially synonyms. They're identical. Yeah. No question. Well, what was your experience when they started or when you got um, deplatformed or canceled or whatever the woke term is for it? What happened uh, to your business? And did, 
did your followers were they still able to to find you yeah because we have followers as opposed to viewers right mm -hmm. you know because people will follow me anywhere for the most part most of our, our people and so we definitely are our um viewers decreased when we were taking out the search engines four years ago now that we were removed from the search engines. So our viewers decreased, but interestingly, our revenues didn't. <laughs> so the only conclusion you can make from that, that the, these extra viewers were just coming in and looking and like tire, tire kickers. They didn't believe what we were doing or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I think eventually over time, a small number of those people would, would wake up and get out of their hypnosis and brainwashing and, and, and smell the roses. Uh, but it is, it's just shocking how effective this propaganda has been when you can have people dying almost immediately after the, the COVID jab and their family not seeing what caused it. They, 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 they just don't see it. I mean, it is, it, it's, it, it's a testimony to how effective this is. I mean, it's, it's shocking, it really is. Um, you alluded earlier in this conversation that you feel like people are starting to wake up and, and not, mm -hmm. you know, they're choosing other sources of information and stuff like that. What, how do you see it unfolding currently? And then like, we're about to go into a contentious election cycle. Um, and certainly that's going to be by design, by, the, yeah. by design. I mean, I suspect it's, pretty obvious that the Democrats aren't going to be doing too well this cycle. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Republicans, for the most part, are any better. They've got their own flaws. So it's, it's a the system designed to create polarization and division. And the reality is that you know, both of the parties are bad. And DeSantis, you know, I was in Florida, so we have, I mean, he did a great job with the last hurricane. Shockingly, we've had islands outside of Cape Coral, Sanibel Island and Pine Island, that they had bridges to them that were just destroyed. And most people thought yes. it would take a, few, take a few years to recover. And he had those bridges back in two weeks. I mean, it, it, it's just unbelievable what he did. No, no, everyone was shocked. So, but he, but he still, he's not, you know, a lot of people are looking at, you can't look at single individuals to take you out of this. It's, it's just recognizing that it's, the, the, the problems are far deeper and it's not a single individual. These almost every president is controlled by the global cabal. And if they don't, they take them out. The last person who, who, who refused to be controlled was JFK. And they took out his brother who, who was actually probably even more oppositional to them. So, you know, that's, I, I just finished reading Bobby Kennedy's book on that called Family Values, which is an excellent book on history, just, fascinating really great read it was in all the details on it it was enlightening um when you said that your business continued to flourish um what what is it that your followers uh get from your business that that you're most proud of just start there well information is the primary thing we give that away for free yeah so, so that's what i'm most proud of i mean i've been able to influence hundreds of millions of people over 25 years. And one of the greatest thrills I get in my lecture because especially the large numbers of people invariably have dozens of people coming up and sharing their personal stories of how their lives were changed or they themselves personally or someone very close to them, a relative, a sibling, a neighbor, not a neighbor, a spouse. Um, you know, their, their lives were saved or they just transformed radically or they, 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 their lights, their eyes opened up and understood what was going on around them. So it's very gratifying to have an influence because when you're a physician, when you go to medical school and you apply, you really want, you go in, most people do want to help people. And uh, the reason I transitioned, because I realized early on with my technology background that I would be able to leverage my ability to influence people positively for health far more by using the internet as a tool. Now, <clears throat> the global cabal does not like that. So there's, that's why they've had such a massive effort to discredit me and take me offline. Even to the point where they, well, either they hired or just coincidentally, you know, one of the, one of the greatest, uh, the biggest hackers out there, I think it's uh, Boston, Bastia, B-A-T-S-B-S-T-I-I, 
they they hacked us uh, two few weeks ago and they took out all our servers and our site was down and our email was gone for two weeks. So we had to recover from that just right before the hurricane hit us. So um, you know there, there's these efforts to not only discredit us but to physically cripple us, which you know they seem to be doing. So, uh, but you know that's only because How did we're, you fight that off. <laughs> I'm just curious, like the. The, the tech behind putting it back online if they were hacking. Oh, it was hard. It was hard. I mean, we were offline for a while. Completely. Yeah. We just, we had to essentially use uh, another platform that we post our articles on Substack. Um, yeah. So we, we sent, we directed, we could direct the, our domain over to there until we were able to get our servers back up and running, yeah. uh, which took a few weeks. Uh, but we still, I didn't have an email for a few weeks, which is, and, and when your email servers are gone, it's not like they queue up somewhere in a magic space. They're just never delivered. And so if anyone that emailed me in that two weeks, you know, I would never know who it was, but I never got it. So, yeah. Yeah. I've had my own issues with uh, tech stacks. <laughs> and one of the, one of the solutions is, uh, is Substack. I, I oh, like yeah, yeah. because they, um, that they don't they don't try to censor you or anything you're kind of on no no way. that's what their commitment to is and we're, we're actually in the top five or six sites on all of substack so oh. we're pretty popular there yeah what do you make of uh elon musk's battle with twitter i, I haven't really followed the financial i mean the uh the legal battle it's hard to say i mean I've been very impressed with his ability to achieve so much. And, you know, he's a tech guy too. And he's pretty smart, committed, uh, but he's got a lot of negatives on him, you know, because he's really involved with projects like uh, Neuralink, which is transhumanism, which seems to be one of the goals of the global cabal, transhumanism for sure. He endorses these, I mean, he was a fan of crypto, but in some ways he's supported things that lead to like universal basic income and you and uh, crypt, uh, central bank digital currency CBDCs, mm -hmm. so he's got some problems. And you know, anyone, anyone, no one, put it this way, no one gets to acquire that much wealth without cooperating with the global cabal. They, 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 they will. They can make or break you. They don't let you get that big unless you're cooperating. They just don't. There's just no way. And he is ostensibly the wealthiest person in the world but that's a bunch of baloney and he even i've actually heard him say it once it's like he referred to putin as being wealthier than him because he has so much control and think control power but the reality is that there's families that have been around for centuries that are, make him look like a pauper but they don't want you to know it because you know the rothschilds would be a classic example but there are others there are many others who have far more wealth than than, than elon does um, when you publish on Substack, do you write about these kinds of things or, do, or you're mostly um, writing about nutritional? I don't write about most, but mostly, no, it's nutrition. Mostly the COVID stuff is what we're writing about. Yeah. And then, and then uh, a lot of, you know, basically health items, as I because I interview some of the leading experts in health in the world, a variety of topics. And, you know, so like we publish those interviews and encourage and inspire people to embrace healthy habits that will essentially uh, insulate them or immunize them effectively and authentically against almost all chronic degenerative disease. Yeah, we could all use that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, so it's Mercola, M-E-R-C-O-L-A.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. that's where, that's, our, that's my primary site. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, yeah it's I've, up I've, and running I, right now. It is, yeah. We, I've written, <laughs> I think, 18 books. Most all of them bestsellers yeah. over the years. So a lot of books. And the most recent one, The Truth About COVID-19. Right. Uh, but the next one I've used is, is a sort of a summary of the last 25 years and what I've learned to help people optimize their health. With, there's a lot of simple basic things like time-restricted eating would be one. Another one's just going out every day for an hour outside with as little clothes as possible, which is hard to do in the winter. But in the summer, it clearly is, isn't. And then getting exposure to sunshine because that will give you vitamin D the right way. You were never designed to swallow vitamin D supplements. You're designed to get it from the sun because you get other benefits than vitamin D. You increase really important antioxidant systems like my, uh, melatonin, which is produced in your mitochondria when you're exposed to the sunshine. 
So uh, nitric oxide, testosterone, uh, structured water in your body, serotonin as a neurotransmitter. So it's amazing stuff. And, and it doesn't cost anything to go in the sun, but hardly anyone does it. Right. <laughs> you know, I, li I, live in, I live in Florida, you know, a little bit north of Orlando on the ocean. And I would say the community I live in is no different than any of the others is probably way less than 5%, probably even less than 1% of people are getting out every day in the sun. They just don't do it. They're busy and they, you know, they, they don't understand how important it is to their health, but it's vital. Everyone's inside in artificial lighting like you are now yeah. uh, in a basement, no sunlight. I mean, it would, uh, windows would be better, but even if you're inside with windows, it's, it does, it's totally different than being outside with the sun on your skin. It doesn't work. I mean, from a light perspective, you're getting healthier light. And I'm glad you're in red light that you're at now because <laughs> that's one of the, well, that's one of the things, artificial lighting is, is really the bane. There, there are a few uh, windows here that I'm getting okay. a little light. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. That's good. But ideally you want to get outside around solar noon. Yeah, to, to, we have a puppy now too. So that he gets me. <laughs> just want to make sure just you're a little, uh, little bit of sun. Yeah, well, you want more than a little bit. <laughs> but you, you know, people don't understand how important that is. But once you do, you can integrate it to your lifestyle. It doesn't mean you have to sit there and do nothing. You can read or walk or do emails. You know, you can multitask for sure. But you it's just so important to integrate those things. And then, and then time restricted eating, we're only eating six to eight hours a, a day and not and making sure that the last three hours are before you go to bed, you're not eating anything. At least three, I do about five or six. Yeah. Uh, and that is a, a really powerful thing because there was a study published in July, Journal of American Cardiology, that showed it looked at the N. Haynes data, which is a da huge database of nutritional information. And as of 2018, would you care to guess how many people in the United States are metabolically inflexible percentage wise? Like, is it one out of 10? Is it two out of 13? I'm going to say something like, eight or seven out of 10. That's really close, but it's, that's far too low. Uh, and this is, 2000, this is 2018 data. So it's already four years old. Uh, and when they timed and did the analysis, it was 14 out of 15 people, 93%. It's probably about 96%. And what is metabolic inflexibility? That means you don't have the ability to seamlessly convert using uh, carbohydrate, yeah. I'm using carbohydrates to primary field using fat. So you can't burn fat effectively, which results in weight gain, which results in uh, metabolic syndrome and increases in risk of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So that's 14 out of 15 people, 14 out of 15, which is a total result of the manipulation of big food and big pharma. Because in 1910, they developed the Carnegie Report by Rockefeller and Carnegie. No, not the Carnegie, the Flexner Report, but Carnegie and Rockefeller funded it. And essentially it was the beginning of the end of American medicine because all the natural therapies just got booted and they replaced it with drug therapies. What's the report called again? The Flexner Report. It was created by Abraham Flexner, F-L-E-X-N-E-R. Um, yeah, and that was supposedly to improve American medicine. It was the beginning of the end. And that morphed and transitioned from using a pharmaceutical paradigm to what we're in now, which is using the vaccine paradigm, because there is no liability. The, you know, these, they've, they've eliminated every single aspect of liability, except for fraud. But when you control the Department of Justice and every federal court, the likelihood of successfully litigating against these criminals is close to zero because they got most of the law on their side. They were able to change the laws to protect them, to insulate them so that they could kill many, many people and harm for sure, seriously harm disabled and cripple people and not have any legal or financial consequences as a result of that. They're essentially immune. Um, that first started in 1986, uh, but then it just got progressively worse and worse and worse to the, the ridiculous scenario that we have today. So anyway, the, the vaccines have this unparalleled immunity so that there's no, legal, there's no financial downside because there have been many drug companies who've spent 
who've lost, who've received judgment. These, most of these drug companies are criminals. Absolutely. And that is not hyperbole. They're literally criminals. They've been found guilty and, and judgments awarded for billions of dollars for killing and damaging and harming people. Knowingly, not accidentally, this is knowingly they've done it. They're criminals. They're absolute criminals. They're liars. And, and they're, they're, primary purpose is to increase their revenues. And that's it. They could care diddly about yeah. human health. Well, you could throw the, uh, the opioid companies in. in uh, that's a classic example. And, they, and, yeah. and even that, the Sacklers were able to manipulate. The judgment should have been over $10 billion. But they, 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 they changed their um, asset protect, you know, to, to, uh, they manipulated and changed the allocation of their assets and, and and, and change it to different corporations so that they minimize their losses. Mm -hmm. So I think it was still a few billion dollars. I don't recall the details of it, but yeah, that's a classic example, the most recent example, Purdue Pharma. And, uh, and, and, and even Johnson & Johnson, I think got hit for a billion or $2, but they're, that's not their first rodeo. They've had many multi-billion dollar lawsuits against them. asbestos and the baby powder was one I could think of. And I think there was others, it was Spiridol, I believe. So, these guys are criminals, and uh, the Pfizer is one of the biggest, no question. Now they're advertising <laughs> at the Super Bowl and stuff. <laughs> you know who pays for the advertising? You know who pays for a lot of it? That was another thing that we exposed is that the US government took a billion dollars from taxpayers that they printed, of course, and, and used it to spread propaganda on the, on the, on the mainstream media. They, they, they fabricated these lies, created them, and they, and they took taxpayer money to spread it. So, and they're advertising, and they give these, you know, all these COVID jabs that you, I probably know they were given away for free. Now, some, not for free, ostensibly, they didn't charge the people who received them, but they were paid for by the taxpayers. It's, it was over a hundred billion dollars that yeah. was given. Well, it's continuing too, don't we have a new- Oh person? yeah, for sure, a hundred percent. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Well, if, uh, if readers want to continue to follow along with your uh, analysis of what's going on, the new boost here, for example, um, they just... You buy Valent, which... <laughs> yeah, you can go to Mercola.com, right? Which got approved for children. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Thankfully, like it's little, not that... Little ones. <laughs> yeah. You know, less than 10% of the parents, maybe as little as 5% of the parents actually we're foolish enough to, to inject our children with this, this nonsense. So, so it's, that's some <clears throat> the good news is some people are waking up at least that there's, they haven't bought the whole story hook, line and sinker. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Mercola.com is where I'm at. Uh, we've got a free newsletter, it comes out every day. There's three articles and we have a Substack community which has all of our past articles. We had to delete <clears throat> all our content last year last August, after the uh, discrediting efforts just to, uh, and threats that we actually received. So, um, so that's our, our current vote. It's, it's a, uh, to see the old articles, you have to be a subscriber, subscriber but it's, it's only like $5 a month and we donate the, uh, the subscription fees for the, the charities that we support. It's good to know. And I appreciate you coming on to talk to me about uh all of your work but also just let people know how they can continue if yeah because uh, this it's a journey i mean you know yeah. i just give a fraction of a fraction of the knowledge that's out there and uh, the, the key is to identify sources that you trust and are that you believe are credible to because you're not going to find it on google you will not find the truth on google that is that is a fact, <laughs> no question about it. You know, when it comes to important topics, now, some things will be true. Like, when was JFK assassinated? Well, you'll find the date, but you won't find out how or why it was assassinated. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but you know, for some basic things that's out there, you can use Google. But for if you really want to know things about anything that's controversial, you will not find it on Google. That is, a, that's a, almost a guarantee. Well, that'll get this program banned then. <laughs> <laughs> why are you on YouTube? Yeah. No, I, I always laugh because um, I talk to a lot of different people and most people that I talk to say something that was worthy of getting me canceled. So 
<laughs> what, on what platform? I'm not that worried about it, but no, it's just funny. Like we're talking about this subject. And, yeah. yeah. If people are searching for the Wigan sessions, they most stuff pops up on Google. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> well thankfully you're still there until you be, until you get out from under the radar. So yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. McCullough. Right. A pleasure to meet you, and uh, thanks for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Be good.